good evening, everyone. I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Vijay Prashad, uh, who will be giving the keynote lecture tonight. So Vijay is a director of Tree Continental Institute for Social Research and chief correspondent for Globe uh, Trotter. His most recent books are Washington Bullets, Monthly Review Press, uh, with a foreword by Ivo Morales Aymam. Um, I just, oopsie. <laughs> I just uh, wanted to say that the first time I, sorry, uh, the first time I saw Vijay was uh, during Documenta 14, where he was um, taking place in the Parliament of Bodies um, in a project by Naim Mohaiman titled Rebuilding the Idea of Global Left. And this was really interesting because it was really a moment where um, uh, like there was a conversation about a certain uh, idea of a possibility of, uh, of a global left and also being very aware of um, uh, uh, melancholia in, in, within the left and like talking about it very openly, but also um, uh, addressing the idea of hope from like a more um, uh, practice, so not really believing in the change, but nevertheless uh, working as if the change will come. So tonight, um, the, ex uh, the, the lecture is titled The Global Left Does Not Exist. Um, so I will just read uh, the small blurb uh, that Vijay sent. The word is fractured by an international division of labor and great divides along lines of wealth and technology driven and magnified by the history of colonialism. Given the immense gaps between different parts of the world, the growth of internationalism has been deeply troubled. Is a global left even possible in these conditions? That is the provocation of this lecture. Um, Vijay, I don't know if you hear me or if I can see you. Hi. Yes, I hear you well. Thanks. <laughs> Great, super. I'm so happy you're here and yeah, to see you also. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks a lot. Um, it's great to be with you and I'm, I want to first apologize um, that I couldn't come in person. Um, I'm actually in between a uh, journey uh, and uh, I was lucky that I was able to get a gap, uh, but I would actually have preferred to be with you um, in person. It's much easier to have these conversations in person than like this. Uh, it's a bit odd and awkward. Uh, especially given that I can't see you and that makes it well even listen no even though I can see you like that it's different I saw you boozing it up earlier during the break and I felt uh, jealous of that because there you were all laughing and and enjoying each other uh, enjoy that it's it's terrific um well, there's a, maybe three points I'd like to make, and then I hope we can have a discussion, although again, in this very peculiar way, but I hope we can have a discussion. Um, the first point I'd like to raise is the question I, I gave as the title about the, um, really the, let's be honest, the difficulty of a genuine left international project. And I want to talk a little bit about culture after that and the importance of, um, of why culture stands in the middle of a left project. And then finally, I'd like to share with you um, a, a document that we are releasing in about two weeks, uh, which is called A Plan to Save the Planet. Um, today's a good day. It's the 1st of October. It's the day that a project I've been involved with for the last six years has finally launched. It's called the International People's Assembly. Um, the International People's Assembly, and you can go to the website, of course, it only launches and exists in this world if there's a damn website. If you don't have a website, you're not alive, uh, you don't exist. Well, today the International People's Assembly has a website and you can go and find it, just Google it and find it. Um, it's a project that is uh, was formed in 2015 at a meeting in Brazil. Um, at the ENFF, which is the National School of Florestan Fernandes, the school of the landless workers movement of Brazil. Um, the MST, the landless workers movement, had called a meeting in Brazil in 2015, hands up in the air saying, is it possible to build an international project, a global left project? Is it at all possible? A range of people came, mainly from Africa, Asia, Latin America, 
and the Caribbean and opened an honest discussion. Um, at the top of the table was uh, the situation of the different international left projects that had been attempted since the fall of the USSR in 1991 and the communist state system of Eastern Europe. Um, since that fall, what had been the various attempts to reconstruct a left? Well, obvious answer, World Social Forum um, created largely, and I think in this respect, its own limitations were given by its origin, created largely in opposition to the World Economic Forum, which meets not far from where you are in Davos, and um, you know has uh, the ha ha attempted to set an agenda for the world, an intellectual agenda, an agenda in the battle of ideas, and nobody seemed to be contesting it. Um, Fidel Castro, you know, just released a book of his some of his speeches. Um, you don't want to see what's behind me, so this is a lot better. It's the first thing I could put up there. Um, Fidel Castro, in a series of speeches in the 1990s, uh, reintroduced the phrase battle of ideas and said, we're in a serious battle of ideas because um, the right, including the sections of the corporate elite, had begun to define what it means to be a human. Um, you know, the, the very definition of human had been absorbed by well, let's call it what it is, by bourgeois thinking. Um, they had an understanding of humanity which was universal and eternal, um, grounded in an idea that humans are basically family-oriented, greedy, that various hierarchies are real. Um, you know, the hierarchies of, say, gender are real. Uh, these are immutable. And um, the hierarchies of, perhaps, um, of class are real and immutable. Somebody has to do the work and so on almost slightly softer versions of Ayn Randian li uh, libertarianism were taken as, as normal um, uh, discourse about the, not the state of humanity, but the, you know, the ontology, uh, the, what it means to be a human was uh, defined by uh, people and it underlay the basic, um, uh, you know, orientation of the World Economic Forum. So in opposition to the World Economic Forum, there was an attempt to create a World Social Forum. Well, early meetings were in Porto Alegre in Brazil, where there was a left government in, 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 in office. And um, the early meetings turned out to be quite interesting. They put out a slogan, another world is possible, which in retrospect is an extraordinarily limited slogan. You know, another world is possible, friends. It could be a fascist world. Um, even that's possible. I mean, it was really a very empty slogan. They didn't have a slogan saying socialism is inevitable or socialism is even necessary. You know, that would have been a sharper slogan. Socialism is necessary. Think of Rosa Luxemburg's, uh, you know, famous slogan, socialism or barbarism. Another world is possible. Yes, barbarism is possible. It's as possible as socialism. Uh, take your pick, guys, take your pick. So the World Social Forum was actually fairly limited ideologically. It didn't frontally take on the World Economic Forum um, and say we have an alternative. What it said is we desperately need an alternative. It was a cry from the dark. You know, it was a de it was a plea, a desperate plea, please. Organizationally, the World Social Forum began to draw its uh, main intellectual uh, references from ATTAC, which was the organization in Europe around the question of taxation, the Tobin tax, for instance. You may not remember all this, but this was all uh, feverishly debated um, in the 1990s and 2000s, particularly, you know, the importance of of taxes of on finance across border financial movements should be taxed and so on. Okay, um, but the real limitation of the World Social Forum was it was an individual place. You know, people could just get an air ticket and show up. Uh, you didn't have to be a member of anything. And by the end of the World Social Forums in Brazil, three quarters of the people who were there were from North America and Europe. M maybe even more than three quarters. It essentially became a NGO festival, um, you know, political and social movements from the South were not available at, at the uh, World Social Forum. The World Social Forum held in India in 2004, in which I participated very actively, 
um, actually had a great dispute because they said any organization with a commitment to armed struggle is not welcome. And so the armed struggle organizations had their own meeting there and it, there was a dispute. Now, all of this is to say, not, not to say that armed struggle organizations uh, should get priority in any way, but all of this is to say that there was a great limitation in the World Social Forum dynamic, an ideological limitation, including its own confidence that it could make a new world. That, that's a very significant limitation. You know, it seemed to lack confidence. And, and as I say, the slogan suggested that. Um, it was a tentative, hesitant slogan. Another world is possible. Um, it was ideologically not coherent and organizationally didn't draw in mass organizations from Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, from Africa, and so on. Um, it was largely a North American, to some extent European, and largely an NGO formation. So it had its limits. So in 2015, at this meeting called by the Landless Workers Movement, which they titled Dilemmas of Humanity, we had a serious discussion about the possibility of launching a new kind of project. Out of that debate and discussion emerged the idea of building the International People's Assembly, which, as I said, launched today. O write this down, guys, October 1st, 2021, the beginning of a new internationalism. Um, the first thing that the IPA is very sensitive about is that um, it cannot repeat all the failures of the Comintern. Um, in other words, there should be no Moscow. Um, you know. I'm a great uh, aficionado of the Comintern with John Riddell. I edited a, a, a book of Comintern texts regarding colonialism. I think the Comintern played an incredible, incredible, important role in facilitating the growth of the left around the world. You know, today is the National Day in China. Um, in the October 1st, 1949, Mao Zedong uh, announces the People's Republic of China. It's a big day today in China. They call it the National Day. Chinese communist movement would not have grown without the role of the Comintern. You know, whatever problems they later develop between the Chinese and the Soviets, in China, they will accept and tell you that without the work of people like Michael Borodin and the schools in Moscow, where, you know, thousands of Chinese comrades went to study um, in the, uh, the school of the peoples of the University of the Toilers of the East, uh, later known as the Stalin School and so on, without those that educational training, um, you know, there would have been no Chinese communist mood of the kind we know. Um, same with Vietnam. I mean, Ho Chi Minh spent his key intellectual years studying in in Moscow and so on. So, I mean, I, I have I look up to the commenter and I salute it and so on. But we have to recognize its great problems. And one of its problems was its directive principle. It would direct parties and tell them what to do and get involved in internal disputes. That's an error we cannot repeat. So the International People's Assembly doesn't pretend to be a directive force. It is merely the centerpiece of a network of international organizations. And as I said, 200 organizations in the course of the past six years signed up to join the IPA. They include uh, organizations such as, of course, the MST in Brazil, Patria Grande, in um in in argentina they include the workers party of tunisia democratic way uh, in morocco they include major trade unions on the african continent like the metal workers union they include um the united uh, the communist party of nepal unified socialist and so on uh, you know there's 200 such organizations that belong to the ipa um and including several in, in Europe, uh, Portero, for instance, from Italy, uh, the Communist Party of Spain and others. Um, so that launches and it su suggests that, well, maybe a global left is possible. But what is that? You know, what is a global left? Uh, uh, this is a global network of political organizations. What makes us left and what are the caverns of solidarity that have opened up between us and others, you know, and, and so on. Um, so I, I would like to come into that uh, immediately and then go to the cultural angle, because I think this is important. Culture slash battle of ideas. What makes us left? I mean, you know, we live in a world now where the levels of uh, of of 
of the great gaps between people has opened up and are intolerable. I mean, in our thinking, we've discussed three apartheids of our present time. Uh, the first apartheid is the apartheid of, of medicine, the obvious one, you know, this vaccine apartheid. What Dr. Tedros at the World Health Organization, you know, an eminent African scientist, he called it vaccine apartheid. You know, he used the, the word apartheid. Um, you know, in Afghanistan, I mean, imagine this, people don't even care how many people in Afghanistan are vaccinated. You know, right now the whole thing is the Taliban is back, but did you know that the vaccination rate in Afghanistan is 1%. Um, this is after all these trillions of dollars spent by the US during its occupation. Um, three quarters of Afghan people don't have access to electricity. 1% uh, has been vaccinated. You know, that's Afghanistan, friends. After $2 trillion of US occupation money spent there, you know, I mean, what are these people capable of in humanity? Um, Rwanda, which is supposed to be the proxy force of the French and is right now out there in northern Mozambique in Cabo Delgado province, uh, shooting at young boys who are trying to, um, you know, fight up and say, why can't we get access to some of this wealth that, Ex that Exxon Mobil and Total are monopolizing this enormous natural gas find off the coast of Cabo Delgado, northern Mozambique. Because they have an insurgency, um, the Rwandan forces are, are there shooting up people. Thousand troops landed. Um, everybody says, oh, they are in the war on terror. But in Rwanda itself, the vaccination rate is 5%. 5%. This is Rwanda, supposedly the country that's you know the most advanced in terms of its relationship to the West and so on. 5% medical apartheid. It's not just COVID-19 vaccines, it's everything. You know, it's everything. The patent regime has basically denied the world, uh, you know, uh, medical care. The second is is a kind of food apartheid. You know, uh, the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization at the UN says that 2.37 billion people don't know when their next meal is coming from. 2.37 billion people don't know where their next meal is coming from. I mean, how do we live every day, you know, on a, on this ridiculous planet? where about one in three people don't know where the next meal is coming from. It's atrocious. Um, 981 million tons of food are wasted every year. Um, 981 million tons. I mean, food waste, food loss, and then the fact that people just are not economically empowered means that they have to starve. It's not that there's not enough food in the planet, by the way. There's ample food. It's they don't have money. If you don't have money, you can't eat. That's called capitalism. That's the problem we face. If we're a global left and we don't take a position on medical apartheid and food apartheid, we've lost our minds. Finally, there's financial apartheid. You know, uh, the developing countries of the world have an external debt, total external debt of $11 trillion. $11 trillion. Sounds like a lot of money. But do you know our research institute did some research and we found we found that at a minimum, $37 trillion is sitting in illicit tax havens. Three times the external debt of developing countries is sitting in these bloody tax havens, some of them in the heart of Europe. You know, they're not all in Panama and in you know, the, the Atlantic Ocean on small islands. No, they're in Europe, you know, many of them. $37 trillion of what? Wealthy bondholder money. Last year, just to put these apartheids together, last year, 64 countries out of 193, 64 countries spent more servicing their debt to these wealthy bondholders than they did on medical care. 64 countries in the middle of a pandemic spent more to service this damn debt than to take care of their own people's health. And where do these wealthy bondholders live? They live in Europe, they live in North America. That's where they live. You know, these are not the elites in Brazil and in South, South Africa and so on. Those elites are, have no, uh, you know, they don't have any purchase. Don't look up to them with any respect, but by God, they are not the ones claiming the money. It's liberal wealthy bondholders sitting in Germany, sitting in in United States and so on that are claiming money in the middle of a pandemic rather than allowing these countries to um, take care of the health calamity that has befallen their um, their people. So the left has to first be constructed on a set of values. You know, we have to take a position on some of these issues. Uh, where you stand on this, I think, is where you get defined. 
Um, anybody who says that these three apartheids cannot be transcended immediately um, is not on the left. And I think that's a dividing line. We have to draw a line somewhere. And then we have to grow and, and fight the battle of ideas. So the first question is, there is no um, left that just exists in the world. You have to build it. You know, there is no left that exists and you build it based on making a claim on the value, the set of values people hold. Um, where do your values take you? Which side of the divide will you stand on? Um, by the way, when I talk about this divide, I don't mean this being like a permanent divide. I hope you understand that. I don't want to be misunderstood. This divide is a divide of values, not a divide of where people stand. You can always move uh, from one side of the values to the other, but we have to delimit. We have to draw a line and say that there's no compromise with somebody who says that wealthy bondholders should first get in line uh, before medical care and so on. You know, that's the line. We draw a line there. Um, and the left is defined based on that line. Okay. Now, how do we conduct the battle of ideas? You know, I, I want to take a little bit of time in this. Because this takes us back to how we should understand the scale of political change. Um, I fear we often don't spend time on this and, and I'm afraid I'm sorry if this is going to be a little elementary, but you know what the hell um, uh, it's a little elementary so be it. Um, there are let's say at least four scales of change that we understand the first scale of change is political change and in a way that's I'm, I'm using the word easiest advisedly it's easier than the others it's the easiest you can win an election. Um, in a country, you know, you can run and you can win an election, you take political power, uh, you can conduct a coup d'etat, you can do all kinds of things and you seize political power. That's the easiest form of so-called political change, where the reins of government come to your hands or even um, the reins of various institutions and so on. Political change, that's pretty easy. Again, in comparison, the second form of change is a little harder and that's economic change. Um, if you have political power, it's possible for you to then construct either a fiscal policy or a monetary policy or have an industrial policy, create a planning policy of one kind or the other. You can move resources around. It's possible for you to have economic changes. It's very possible. Lift the minimum wage, for instance. That's a pretty straightforward um, policy objective of even a liberal government. Lift the minimum wage. Uh, encourage forms of, of political of economic activity by subsidizing them, uh, you know, give a floor price, create some tariffs, uh, increase spending on certain sectors and so on. Economic change is pretty uh, possible. You know, it's, it's harder than others, but it's easier than, uh, sorry, it's harder than political change, but it's easier than the others that I'm coming to. The third form of change is social change. Here, you know, let's take the the issue of, of gender uh, relations. It's not that difficult here either. It's possible. Um, for instance, you can come in and say inheritance law, we're going to have, uh, a, you know, we're going to put forward in our society a, um, a referendum on the fact that, um, you know, the daughters and sons in a family get must get equal inheritance. Uh, there should not be a gender bias in inheritance. Or you can have a law saying that women can sue for divorce as much as men can. And by the way, you might roll your eyes and say, well, this already is the case in Austria or, or in Germany, not the case in many countries in the world um, or an abortion law, for instance, as you know, they had in Argentina recently. Um, you say we're going to have an abortion law. We're going to make abortion legal. That has an immense social impact. And so social changes are also possible to legislate to push through, um, you know, through government power or even through social movement power. So these are three forms of change that are pretty easy, you know, political change. And again, by the way, I keep saying easy, but obviously they're difficult, but they are easier than the fourth. Political change, economic change, and then social change. The hardest change is cultural change. It's the hardest. It's actually where the left faces its greatest defeats. And that's where the battle of ideas comes in. What, what is a cultural change? I mean, listen, let's be honest. We inherit some pretty terrible habits and practices and cultural forms from the past. You know, I mean, Marx got it clear, you know, when he wrote, I think it's in the 18th Brumaire, he writes about how the nightmare of the past hangs heavy 
on the present. You know, I think he's talking about the cultures that we inherit, you know, wretched forms of hierarchy, you know, patriarchy, uh, racism, uh, ethnic differentiation, uh, even forms of, of disparagement on class lines, you know, certain class cultures, the way people talk is disparaged and so on. I mean, culture is just a wretched place. Uh, and, you know, we, we have to really engage some rather hideous things. Um, I, I remember being in college, you know, all in, I was in college in the 19, late 1980s. All my friends, we were all going to live, you know, these sort of feminist lives. And everybody said, you know, we are not going to reproduce what our parents did. You know, that idea that, you know, women do the cooking and men do the sitting around waiting for the meal to come. We are going to have equal thing, this, that. Then, you know, uh, you 20, 30 years later, you visit people and you're like, good God, how, how did you become like your parents, you know? And, and you have to reflect on that. We used to joke in our movement, we used to say, outside the house, all the men are Che Guevara. Outside the house, you are Che. Inside the house, you are Pinochet, you know, because uh, you are like a dictator, you know? And um, let's face it, these are serious cultural you know, like an undertow in the ocean, it sucks you into this thing that, you know, you say uh, now, oh, I'm in a, I'm a man, I'm in a relationship with a woman, she is pregnant. Well, she's going to have to take time to take care of the child because, you know, biology, she has to give milk, you know, breastfeed and so on. And all these things just come back and they just usurp um, the thinking in, in, a, in, a, in a, even in a couple, you know, they usurp the thinking. And all kinds of old hierarchies, wretched things that you intuitively dislike because you're political and so on, they just return and they absorb you. And I just want to put it as bluntly as possible in this way. But of course, it's even graver because we have to recognize that the, one of the great advantages that the right has, that conservatives have, that traditionalists have and so on, is they build their movements on the wretched hierarchies that exist. That's an enormous advantage. You know, anytime there's a problem for them politically, they can have a racist thing or they talk about defending the sanctity of the woman, you know, and, and abortion and whatever. I mean, look at the Polish uh, government, you know, um, they, they can just reach out into the worst kind of hierarchies and they drive a political agenda. Uh, they have an enormous advantage. I often feel that hate Democracy has an easier time acknowledging the politics of hatred than the politics of love. Politics of hatred is much easier, you know, because our cultures that we inherit are a kind of congealed hatred. And I'm, I know I'm saying this a little maybe too strongly, but our cultures are a kind of congealed hatred. How else to understand, say, patriarchy or racism and so on? These are congealed hatreds, you know, it's a kind of, it's a hatred of, of, of certain people. And this congealed hatred advantages the right automatically uh, because they can take, you know, they can use it, they can weaponize it, uh, you know, they can galvanize people and get them excited and so on. The politics of the left is the politics not of the past, but of the future. And that's a problem because we are trying to construct something better, which doesn't exist now. You know, it, 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 if it exists, it only exists in small pockets. We're trying to construct a future. And how do you appeal to people to believe the future is possible? You know, that's a, that's a very difficult thing. That's what I mean, that the left generally has to orient itself around the politics of love, which democracy doesn't know how to deal with. Uh, just to be totally frank, I think democracy has a lot of problems. And one of them, it can't deal with the politics of love. You know, you walk into a room and you tell people you've got to care for each other and all that. It's not... It, it, of course, appeals to certain sensibilities, but it doesn't seem to be as captivating as when you walk in and give a wretchedly nasty speech about how migrants should be hated or that, you know, women should, should know their place and so on. That can create a certain hard enough minority of, vo of, of voters that become your, uh, your campaigners and so on. We just don't see the same advantages afforded from, from our old cultures uh, to the left. Now, we know that when uh, the decolonization, during the decolonization period in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, we know that in that era, our political movements were well aware of this problem. They were well aware of it. Um, and they articulated it pretty forcefully. You know, 
uh, they argued, for instance, against two kinds of escape hatches for our movement. One escape hatch was temporal and one escape hatch was spatial. The temporal escape hatch was go back to the past. Say that in some ancient time, uh, we were a great people before colonialism. You know, we, we were great in the past, the golden age. Um, and, you know, uh, let's just go back to the past and, and we'll build from the past. Um, that's one escape hatch. It's totally uh, unsatisfactory because we know if we look actually at the past, it's pretty nasty. Um, you know, colonialism was not responsible for every bad thing in India, for as an example. I mean, um, in India, caste oppression long predates colonialism. And it's a hideous thing from our ancient world. It's got nothing to do with, with the poor British, you know. The poor British brought a lot of nasty things and did some terrible things. And I mean, I've often wondered how did these this pathetic little island conquer so much of the world? But that's a different story. But they're, they're not responsible for everything. You know, uh, we had our own problems. So um, one is the escape hatch of the past. The other is the escape hatch spatially, where you say, well, actually, our whole tradition is useless and we have to westernize completely. We have to absorb everything from the West. Um, the West is going to be our salvation. And that's a kind of spatial escape hatch, also wrong. Um, because it's not, firstly, it's not adequate. Um, you have to deal with your own histories. You have to deal with your own cultures and so on. Um, the great Leninist communist writer, Jose Carlos Mariategui, put it very well. He said, the past is not a destination, it's a resource. You know, we're not trying to go back to the past. We want to draw from the past. We don't need to also, you know, the West is not a destination. It's also a resource. One must draw the best of Western science, thinking and so on. We should not be jingoistic and narrowly nationalistic in cultural terms, a very wrong attitude. One has to have the scientific temper and so on, which is why at the Bandung conference in 1955, and this is very little appreciated, Right after, in the final communique, there's a long section on economy, and then the next section is on culture. Um, the second section is on culture uh, before other sections come in. Because the people recognize, the leaders recognize that if you don't tackle the cultural limitations in our countries, you can't advance anything. Uh, you can't advance anything. And, and I just want to make a little detour here to the kind of academic work that developed, particularly after the 1980s, um, around uh, you know, Asia, Africa, Latin America in particular, but also to some extent, maybe in Eastern Europe, where you know, we were sort of being told there was a kind of cultural relativism going on. We were not able to see, because we were so anxious about the co colonial thought and how the colonials had said that you know, we are backward people, we became too embarrassed to actually say there are parts of our history that are backward, you know, and, and I'm quite happy to use the word backward and I'm happy to discuss that if you'd like later. There's a lot of backward things in our history that we need to engage with and deal with. You know, we can't say everything in our culture is good. That's a wretched way to look at our past. Uh, we've got to engage with our own backwardness and see what has to be advanced and so on. Um, I know there's a kind of post-structural anxiety about this, you know, oh, why do you say backward? You know, it's not back. I, that doesn't uh, that doesn't actually captivate me, that critique. Um, I'm not captivated by that at all, because I think it, it it's too forgiving to our cultures, uh, which have a lot of problems. Um, you know, in India, the question of caste and misogyny are at, at the height. Um, you know, young women can't board public transport in the city of New Delhi without being harassed. Uh, that's not because of colonialism. You can't say, oh, that's watching American movies or whatever. Uh, that's nonsense. We have our own problems. We have to look them straight in the eye, engage them. Uh, we can't just say everything is coming from abroad. You know, um, That's as bad as saying everything good will come from abroad. I I'm saying that's that spatial and temporal uh, escape hatch. We have to have a deeper assessment, realistic assessment of our own problems. So in at Bandung, they engage this directly and right through the UN system using UNESCO, um, they push this agenda, anti-racist agenda and so on, which I think is quite powerful, including through UNESCO in 1980 with the McBride report, thinking about how to democratize the media. Um, because in the battle of ideas, there are two features. One feature is the ideological, which is what I've been talking about largely. 
you know, how to think about cultural change, how to think about, um, you know, uh, confronting culture in all aspects of, of, of cultural work. Uh, th this includes, um, you know, from broad intellectual work to the artistic production. How do you engage culture? How do you, 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 you um, expand people's horizon, you expand their imagination, you allow people to dream about a different kind of, of reality. You know, when it comes to things like gender relations in the household, uh, from the intellectual side, you can talk about the possibility of creating more uh, creches in society, you know, more uh, areas for children to be raised in common in a neighborhood. So that, uh, you know, you don't have to have somebody at home privatizing early child care. You can have child care being a collective social endeavor where, you know, people maybe take turns or you hire somebody. And, and that, that's the intellectual thinking that could broaden the imagination. And then somebody makes a film about a futuristic society, a kind of science fiction film where people live a liberated environment, you know, different ways to engage the expanding of the imagination. Because isn't that what the cultural block is? That the imagination is stifled. People can't imagine anything different. And I'd said this earlier, in the battle of ideas, the bourgeois thought becomes eternal and universal. Uh, again, spatially, temporally, it blocks us. Um, it becomes eternal, it's forever, across all time. And universal, you know, the whole world has to submit to this kind of thinking. Our imagination is kind of constipated. You know, we have to break through this. We have to find a way um, to imagine things in a deeper and richer way. And here, culture workers play an enormous role um, in expanding the imagination in this battle of ideas. Um, you know, McBride report was about communication. So it's not just about the ideological thing. It's also about the institutional forms. How do you reach people? Um, the McBride report was about how um, certain Western news outlets were basically suffocating thinking and how there should be a new um, communications order in the world. They took the inspiration from the new international economic order passed by the UN General Assembly in 1974. Um, so, you know, it's not just an ideological battle, it's also an institutional battle. Who gets to uh, reach whom and how? And can we build different institutions? And I think this is a key question of debate and discussion for people. Um, at the International People's Assembly, we have built a network of media outlets, including one called People's Dispatch. And you know, we're trying our best to produce movement-based news uh, and reach as many people as possible, uh, create new institutional forms and so on. And, and I encourage you to think seriously not just about the ideological side of the cultural struggle, but also the institutional side. How do we bring masses of people in? Um, you mentioned Documenta earlier. What an interesting project that is. You know, large numbers of people come uh, to some of those discussions and so on. How do you take people, more people into these discussions? You know, and I, I see these, you know, I was at the Kochi Binale uh, in, in, in Kerala. And um, again, there are large numbers of people come in and see the art and come for the discussions and so on. That's what really appeals to that. It's a great appeal. I'm very much brought into the process of having these massive public art, uh, you know, endeavors in a city or in an area because it's democratizing art. You know, it, it brings art out of the museum into the public. In fact, in Kochi, the discussions are held in the open air. And uh, lots of people just stroll by and sit down and listen. It's, it's, it's quite an interesting experiment. So we have to think more about institutional uh, formations, you know, to, for the battle of ideas, not just the, getting the right ideas, but how do you bring the ideas into a mass discussion, uh, you know, linking with mass movements, with peasant movements and so on. How do you take art into mass movements? At Tricontinental, we make a big deal of bringing poetry and, and beautiful drawings to people. Um, you know, we want all our materials to look beautiful. And we, we, we believe that we have to think seriously about the politics of aesthetics and how, um, you know, you, know you, you don't just produce the right ideas, but you have to expand people's imagination. And that requires a different kind of feeling uh, than merely just, you know, these are the six points and so on. Um, you have to actually come at the level of feelings and at the level of, of uh, how people experience ideas, not just how they acknowledge or they absorb ideas. Okay, finally, um, you know, drawing some of these things together, 
as part of our work of our institute, we've been uh, having a discussion with 25 research institutes around the world. And in on the 16th of October, I believe it's the 16th, might be the 18th, uh, we're going to release a text called A Plan to Save the Planet. Um, this is a text which you know is going to be about, I don't know, 10, 15 pages long, not very long. Um, and it's going to have uh, various points uh, on health, on education, on work, on care, um, and so on. Uh, one of the sections is going to be on culture. And um, I, it's, it's a pretty interesting uh, discussion that all us 25 research institutes from Cuba, uh, from Zimbabwe, from India, uh, from Italy, uh, from the UK, and so on. We've had some really deep discussions about these issues. Um, and we've talked a lot about what the battle of ideas looks like. Um, and how we can, for instance, in terms of culture, we have to defend um, the charter of UNESCO. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you have gone and read the charter of UNESCO, but it's a pretty amazing document. I, I, I really commend it to you. You know, we don't have to invent everything from new. Um, the UN charter is an extraordinary text. The UNESCO charter is extraordinary from 1945. The work of UNESCO is pretty amazing. So, you know, we say we've got to really go and, and engage that uh, again and engage with UNESCO directly. Um, you know, un UNESCO is, is, is largely an interstate uh, agency, but it need not be. If you read the charter, there is no obligation for it to merely be an interstate body. Um, mass movements should, could get involved with UNESCO. You know, as a child in Calcutta, I learned a lot reading the free magazine from UNESCO called UNESCO Courier. Uh, it used to be put in the library not far from where I live. And you could go to the library and read it. And it was my window to the world. Um, it played a big role in, in our lives. That magazine, of course, has been shut down. Um, and you know, we, we don't have access for young people around the world to get you know, the material reality. And I'm, I'll give you another uh, example of from my childhood things that I, I miss in the world today. Um, I was in a, a school in Calcutta where during Hiroshima Day on the 6th of August every year, uh, the whole school was given a lecture about what is Hiroshima Day. And I admit it was a pretty pedestrian lecture. Uh, probably the Wikipedia entry today was better than our lecture we received uh, that morning. But then we were sent off to our classrooms and given pieces of paper and we had to draw an artwork. Um, you know, with a pile of colored pencils uh, that represented Hiroshima. And then the best artwork was selected. This was for the younger kids. The older kids had to write a one page essay. The best essay was selected or best five essays and the best drawings. And those were put on the wall. All the kids would walk by and see it. Um, Hiroshima Day, the major day in the peace calendar of the left, had a mass character. This is gone from our, our lives. You know, our children don't grow up thinking about Hiroshima. They don't grow up uh, thinking about the partisans. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what education there is in the Balkan countries around the great partisans. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, I remember, uh, remember we were in Berlin together um, at that event. And I think Sanya told me there's 60,000 or 16,000, I've forgotten the exact, of partisan songs. And I thought, I want to memorize all of them. Um, and why aren't children learning them today? You know, why don't we, uh, why don't we reach out to uh, young pop stars, you know, who are popular and, and say, hey, listen, why don't you cover a couple of these partisan songs? Um, why don't we make these things popular again? You know, uh, this is the work of a cultural worker is we have to enter the mass dialogue. Um, so, you know, the, I'm going to end very soon, but um, in our plan to save the planet, we take all these things very seriously and we're interested with in building a calendar for the left. Uh, so we already have a Red Books Day, which is in February, uh, February 21st, which is the day of the publication of the Communist Manifesto. And we introduced it two years ago when 65,000 people around the world read the Communist Manifesto in their own language. Um, from uh, South Korea all the way out to Chile. And we did it again during the pandemic. We had about 45,000, much less number. We hope that in time, Red Books Day becomes like a regular thing in the calendar of the left, where people all around the world will go in public. In fact, the first year we did it, five people gathered at Connolly Bookstore in Dublin, Ireland, 
and read it out in Gaelic. Uh, that was amazing. In Tamil Nadu, uh, there were public readings in the streets. Uh, it, it was the most impressive. In Cuba, at the center, Martin Luther King and the Marinello Institute, they read it out in, in chain. They took a turns to read it out and so on. We're going to do this every year. We want that to be part of um, the agenda of the left. We want Hiroshima Day to come back as a great day of peace, uh, to commit not to have these horrendous wars. You know, uh, I want to see a world where children once again are doing drawings of what they think is a peaceful world rather than the world of war. To expand the imagination. Imagine if children in Austria, in every school, had to have a moment of silence on Hiroshima Day. They would have a moment to reflect, even briefly, on the atrocity of war. We want to bring that back as an important day in the calendar of the left. And finally, uh, my own personal favorite day is October 9th. And I know this is not going to pick up. That's the day in which Che Guevara was killed. I would like to see that as the international day to abolish the CIA. But I very much doubt that that's going to pick up, friends. Um, but you can go online and you can see a video we made called International Day to Abolish the CIA. It's a pretty funny video. Um, you can find that on YouTube. Now, wrapping everything up together. Well, we do have a global left. At least it's in construction. Uh, a global left isn't something that is. It's something that has to become. And it only becomes when people get involved in it. Um, you know, when people say things like, oh, the left, this, the left, that, I often wonder, who are you talking about? Uh, it's often just a boogeyman. I don't know who you're talking about. The left has such a bad position on this. The left does that. Uh, I don't know who you're talking about. And also, if you want to improve it, get involved in it. Um, you can't improve things by sniping at it from the side. You have to be involved. And I think often people aren't involved. And to be involved is to be involved as much practically as anything, building institutions, getting involved in the institutions that exist and so on. Um, we're in a big struggle. I mean, we, we are literally in a big existential struggle. Uh, our ideas are simply not, uh, you know, they don't have a grip in humanity. Our ideas are at the side. Uh, we have to fight like hell to get our ideas gripped by humanity. You know, I, I read the German ideology by Marx and Engels years ago. And I remember thinking, wow, this is incredible. Because the first time I ever learned that ideas by themselves don't change history. You know, and you know, I know this because we on the left have such fantastic ideas. Ideas have to take on a mass force. They have to be gripped by the masses. They have to have what Marx and Engels call a material character. You know, they have to be seized. They have to have power. Uh, you can't change the world with ideas. You have to change the world in a combination of ideas and power, that mass force that where your vision of a future grips the masses and they are seized by it. Um, we have to try to build that together, I think. And isn't that the job of the culture worker to try to expand our imagination? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, Ijad. It was, as always, very inspiring, illuminating. Um, I was wondering one thing uh, when you did this, let's say, short history of the international after '91, um, and you talk about the World Forum and so on. Um, probably you take also the kind of sharper alter globalization or anti-globalization movement as a part of it well I, but still it was a social movement that was probably in terms of ideas and politics uh, much more radical than just a forum of ngos and it was happening not just in the north american european context but more general so that's one small kind of um, Think then the second one, uh, congratulations for the launch of the Institute, I mean, Institute of the, of the International People's Assembly. Um, a small question, does it have or did it have some 
uh, dialogue with the Progressive International. I mean, it has, because the Progressive International also wanted to have a certain kind of internationalist movement, even though it was connected to, you know, parties in the Western, so to speak, hemisphere. Um, and then uh, just the idea, I really like this red calendar and, you know, kind of instituting certain form. I mean, it has uh, also partisans had the calendars or there is the proletarian calendar and so on. So that's interesting. Um, you bring it out so prominently. And one uh, thing that we were also a bit discussing today, but also it's ongoing discussion is to think of this, let's say counter memory or memory that is not so much focused just on violence, right? Or just like um, what was horrific events that we have to remember, but kind of the whole memory culture is then kind of focused on this violence from memory studies to memory culture, 20th century is the age of catastrophe. So we are not talking about revolutions anymore, about emancipation, so kind of, this future memory, so to speak, uh, should be much more focused on inter intersectional fights or victories of the oppressed in the past and opening to certain future. So this kind of calendar, kind of this memory, you know, um, should really have a close look or how you kind of not divorce yourself you know, violence is part of our societies, right? So it's quite important for the left to also think of, you know, these different forms of violence that there are in our societies. But I think it's also time that we kind of emphasize, you know, this moment of emancipation for memory and future. Um. Hi, so do you want to get all the questions or shall I ask another one? Like, or you want to answer first to this before losing the thread? No, no, I would prefer actually to hear more of your voices first, okay. if you don't mind. Okay, yeah, thanks for this. It was um, quite uh, enchanting. But also please tell me your name because Gal Kern I know because I met him in Berlin, but I don't know you. So please tell me your name. Aziz Aharmat. <laughs> Aziza Harmel, we were in contact like for some time now. <laughs> so yeah, that's me. Um, yeah, oh yeah, okay. Well, I'll, I'll sh I don't know where is the camera. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, so um, yeah, so I wanted to say something about the way you speak, which is related also to the book that you are launching soon, but also, like when you're giving a talk in Documenta, I remember someone saying after your talk, like, I don't know what you're on, but I would want to have to be on the same <laughs> because you seemed like, you know, and again, tonight you, you, you are, of course, a great speaker and like it's, there's a lot of energy. And I think that is really important as much as uh, the organization, you know, like the political organization is important. I think the work of enchantment and the work of uh, the work of actually bringing back speeches, like you know, beyond any kind of populism, or like you know, or maybe also another form of populism. But this way of you know, like that the cultural worker or the intellectual, if we want to be like a bit more like uh, traditional in that sense, is the enchanter, is the link between um, the people and the words. And like, you know, and I think these, 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 these methods are very important. And, you know, some of the things you said, like we could roll our eyes, but like, but it's still, you know, sad. And even though like, it's very important to repeat it. And like, you know, even though it's like, you know, isn't the role of the cultural worker to imagine, I mean, like, it's so simple, but it's also so beautiful to be said. And like, you know, and it's really very important to be remembered because we're like so depressed, you know, and like, and it's just so hard to continue, like, you know, like to continue the job and to wake up and to continue the fight, you know, over and over again. So I think this is really important the, the, uh, to take the work of enchanting as serious as the, like, as the political organization. Yeah, thanks again. Yes, Jihan? Yeah. Can I be a bit of a party pooper? Um, uh, <laughs> my name's Jihan Al-Tahri. I'm a 
visual artist and a filmmaker. Um, uh, two things. Uh, first of all, um, how are you financing the IPA? Um, because I think one of the biggest calamities, and I think you did address it a bit when you were talking about it might be easy to change the economic, is whatever real idea and whatever real infrastructure you, you're building, ultimately it needs to get financed. And today you get stuck in this loop of who is financing you. And I'm not asking this, this question in terms of judgment. I'm asking it in terms of structure. Uh, second point is the, um, when you were talking about looking backwards, um, you did kind of save the day a bit later saying uh, the, the quote, but I do think that um, looking backwards, especially I'm Egyptian, by the way, um, uh, there is a kind of, especially the, the, the generations uh, now, we have no idea what our background is. And this re-examining, reinterpreting, re-criticizing, re-whatever, and especially in the visual culture, um, we're handed, and that's where the difference between official history and memory lies. Um, so not looking backwards means we just run forwards with whatever education we have. And that education is highly problematic. I just wanted to get you to say something about backwards. Hi, Vijay. It's Paula Barreiro Lopez. We met, I think, in Brighton <laughs> at the conference of on the global 60s. So I, I was I interested, thank you very much for your talk, about find quite interesting that you are finding very useful the UNESCO chart, and it's not a criticism against the UNESCO chart, of course, but it's interesting because these kind of organizations, I, I remember um, a research on the UNESCO had uh, like, like beautiful goals uh, to bring art to everybody and to do, they were the first that they did a series of um, color reproductions of master works of art around the world that they did exhibitions. And the interesting thing is finally, uh, the UNESCO, with all these beautiful goals, they were reinforcing in a strong way uh, Western, Western uh, thinking, no? the way that they chose the masterworks of art. Or the, the, so I remember reading that I think some, someone from India was saying, oh, really, this is not a global vision of art. So I was thinking, finally, these institutions, I find interesting how you can use this history in a non in a in a critical way because how they were used and how it can be useful for us today. So, uh, because the case of UNESCO, I think is a beautiful theory, but the practice of the UNESCO has its uh, shadows. No, and and so how can you how are you using all of this? No, all this material. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, Sanjukta. I, I'm just thinking aloud here in this whole project of uh, reviving, retrieving uh, global left. What place do you see for the party political left? And I'm saying this because, you know, I've, you know, the left has politically uh, failed spectacularly in contexts where it has been in power for so many years. Um, I, for instance, come from Bengal in Calcutta, in, in India, and I see, and we were talking about this yesterday, you grew up under a political left that ruled for 30 years and ensured the decay of every structure till you leave the space and go somewhere else and you realize while you critique the political left foundationally, you are that. <laughs> epistemologically, emotionally, you cannot leave that. So one then becomes like an exile in a, in a left and keeps grappling with what can the political left do? So, so I guess this gathering is 
you know, makes me think about this, that I understand the cultural left, I understand the global internationalism, but there is something about locational grassroots politics and the failure of a party political structure to extend patronage to that. And I was just wondering what your thoughts on that could be, uh, whether there is any responsibility really at that level, or should we just give up on them? Hello, Vijay. Thank you for your talk. My name is Tobias Locker. I just wanted to ask you if you could comment on one point. And uh, this was, you were referring, uh, yes, within the International People's Assembly also, uh, I, I understood it to integrate also armed struggle. So if you compare also to the history of armed struggle in the 1960s, you see that also in, uh, in the uh, in the Turkic continental that uh, actually also the cultural struggle had a different kind of force, I think, which is lacking today. But uh, how did you think about when just like gathering ideas for your new foundation that you uh, uh, launched today, how do we, did you think about the point of critique because right now we are living in time where uh, the term uh, terrorism is used inflationary by uh, regimes all over the world. This could be uh, democratic regimes or dictatorial regimes, but everything which goes against the uh, power which is installed in a certain area is defined as terrorism. And as I understood it, you don't actually create a platform to just like bar these people from entry, you create a kind of forum and you want to have it in, in terms of like the tri-continental, a kind of international solidarity, which accepts also and which uh, raises awareness uh, for, for kind of armed struggle or for force needed in some places. So how did you tackle intellectually or maybe future critique, which will certainly arise uh, against these kind of, yes. Uh, struggles. Thank you. Hello, my name is Olya Alvia. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. I'm struggling a bit to put into words what I want to say. Um, I found it very interesting that you said um, not everything has to be invented anew. That's something I tell myself all the time and that, that I do not tell younger colleagues even if I'm tired while watching them forcefully and with a lot of work uh, come to the same conclusions that people have come to 100 years ago too. So that's a frustration that I have that I uh, would like you maybe to say something uh, about. But also I think that um, younger generations, there is also a lot of, um, there is a power in thinking that you're inventing something new. And then maybe later on recognizing your struggle in a past struggle. So what I'm interested in is this, um, um, this, uh, polarizing thing between how do we connect to past um, legacies and how do we allow um, gener new generations to to still be uh, in, um, captivated by uh, imagination. That's it, Vijay. I mean, you have quite a lot on your plate already. <laughs> Let's don't make it like too too long. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. No, no, no. That's okay. I, I'll I'll be very I'll well. I don't want to disrespect these questions because they're so good. But uh, I won't take too long. You're right. Uh, I'll I'll use this opportunity to wrap up. Is that okay, Aziza? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, you know I, I'm not going to go in order, but I'll 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 go in a kind of logic. Uh, the first is that on the question of armed struggle, I was merely making a point about the World Social Forum. Uh, actually, in, of the 200 organizations in the International People's Assembly, uh, nobody really is committed to armed struggle. And that has to do with even the difference between 2004 and 2021. Um, matters are quite different now. Um, you know, uh, very little, very few sections of the left. I mean, look, the FARC, 
between 2004 and 2021 has come above ground uh, thanks to the peace accord signed in Havana between the government and and the FARC and the FARC will is participating in elections in Colombia uh, so you know the situation is very different now and the issue of armed struggle is no more on the table for for most of uh, the movements that at least I uh, deal with and I think some of this has to do with with the question of on the one side, what Tobias said, terrorism as the dominant discourse against armed struggle, but also that people were exhausted. I mean, I remember interviewing Victoria Sandino, a major commander in the FARC, and she said, look, I just want to go home. And, you know, I've been at this for uh, 20 some years in the jungle and we're getting nowhere. And I think that's uh, experience shared across many left groups that had taken the gun that many people were like it's just not happening um, any longer um gal you know that issue of the alter globalization etc that's true there were uh, various radical strands but they didn't actually form any kind of international project that was beyond a network project uh, that's what i was just trying to say that they had network i was involved in those uh, I was involved in the anti-patent law project and, you know, we, we were there, you know, well, maybe I shouldn't say this on a Zoom call, but we were there doing all kinds of things. Um, but there was no uh, international project like the World Social Forum that came out of it, you know. It was a kind of minority project in a sense and it was, uh, it fell apart uh, here and there. Um, there were so many disagreements around how to understand globalization and so on, unfortunately, by the way. I, I don't take any pleasure in, in the fact that it fell apart. Um, I'm a member of the Council of the Progressive International, so I, I, I work with them as well. It's a completely different project. Um, the IPA has got a longer history and it's rooted in building a, 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 a network of movements uh, from the beginning, which is why it's taken us six years before we can launch. Uh, the PI is, it was initially a, a, a network of, of people. Uh, not movements. Uh, it was people, many, you know, attached to different movements, but it wasn't movements that were actually creating, constructing the project. It's the, it's the other way around. I think there's room in the world for lots of different kinds of endeavors and projects, and I welcome more and more and more, you know. Uh, we've got to experiment and see what clicks. We can't get sectarian about these things. And we will work closely and do. I mean, I, I'm both on the coordination of the IPA and on the council of the PI. So, you know, at least in my own person, there's coordination, uh, if not otherwise. And in fact, there is otherwise coordination. Um, that's, of course, the case. Um, Aziza, I just got off a, an overnight flight. So I don't know what you mean by enchantment or whatever the hell, because uh, basically I'm blind tired. And um, this is, I'm going to get on another flight in about an hour and a half. So that's why I have this backdrop because I don't want to show you where I am. Uh, but uh, I, all I can say is that I learned years ago, Aziza, I mean, uh, Sanjukta, I, I, I'm a member of the CPIM, uh, the Communist Party of India Marxist, and I've been a CPIM member for 30 years. Um, and I was born in Bengal, but I didn't actually spend much time there. Um, I, many years ago, when I was uh, decided to go and get a PhD, um, I, I was a journalist, practicing journalist, and I was interested in studying why um, the poor killed the poor in the pogrom of 1984 in Delhi. Uh, why were poor people killing other poor people? 3,000 Sikhs killed essentially in a weekend. And I arrived at the University of Chicago and my advisor there um, told me, well, you know, this is not going to be for you, the academic life. It was the late 1980s, you know, postmodernism was at its heyday. And he said, you're just not going to survive in this profession. Uh, I said, why? But I'm really interested in this. He said, no, because you see, you, the problem is you're not interested in, in, acad in the academic life. You're interested in why the poor kill the poor. And he said, that's a big problem and you're going to face this problem because when you go into a seminar, you're going to actually be interested in things in the world. We are interested in developing intellectual thought and you're going to be an orphan in, in our seminars. And I found that to be exactly correct. You know, I thought, what is he talking about? I'm also interested in ideas. 
but I found that peculiarly satisfying as an explanation. I remember going into these seminars thinking, what are they talking about? They keep referring other books and they keep, it's like an intertextual world that, you know, a world of books and ideas and the world, the outside world doesn't come in. And I remember going for a seminar with Frederick Jameson, where he kept talking about worlding, you know, the importance of context and worlding and historicizing. And I thought, but the world is not entering this seminar room. You know, all your concerns are the concerns of the concept, not the concerns of what the concept is supposed to represent or what the concept is supposed to drive. I found it incredibly frustrating. And uh, I, I don't know what I'm trying to say to you, Aziz, except that, you know, if you if you learn to love human beings and you think that the world is a shit and you need to improve it, I, I just don't understand why we need to talk in any other way than how we feel, you know, and I just don't get it. Okay. You know, maybe it's naive and maybe, you know, as you said, well, when you say expand the imagine, we all know that. Well, I don't know if we all know that, you know, and I don't know if we're honest with each other and know exactly what that means. You know, do we really know that? Listen, when I read these journals of art criticism, I don't understand what half of the people are saying, frankly. You know, I don't know who this stuff is written for. I don't get it. The jargon is totally impermeable, you know. And so whose imagination are you expanding? Certainly not ordinary people, you know. And we have to really come to a grip with that, frankly. I don't have a problem with theory. I mean, I, I read a lot of theory and I enjoy it. My problem is communication. Are we communicating ideas, democratizing our forms of communication? Not only talking about democracy, but democratizing forms of communication. You know, can you go into a bar and, and give a lecture in a bar and interest people in your ideas? You know, that's the should be the test, friends. I mean, right? That, that's what I'm. I'm. In, I, I'm not even interested in that. That's what we have to practice. So you know, that's that's how I would um, I would approach that. Um, you know, the issue of UNESCO, of course, it's limited. It's based in Paris. Why should it be based in Paris? Why can't it be relocated? You know, why should all these UN institutions be in Rome and Brussels in Paris and New York? Why can't we relocate it to, I don't know, Bahia or Salvador in the northeast of Brazil? Um, it's not the, uh, the UNESCO constitution's fault that the, uh, you know, entire culture of UNESCO is absorbed by you know, kind of Western art or whatever. The constitution itself is pretty good, the charter. Um, the problem is we have to contest it. It's, it's an institution that needs to be contested and it needs to be taken hold of, you know. Uh, right now, the only person contesting UNESCO is the US government and the Israelis um, because they are upset that, that UNESCO actually took a pretty good position on Palestinian cultural heritage and so on. So they are the only ones contesting it. Where are where are the art critics coming in and saying, let's we have a plan for UNESCO. Let's go and and, you know, make some school projects of introducing school children to drawing, you know, and, and so on, because they have the institutional capacity. It's just that they don't do anything anymore. It's a moribund building in Paris. Go and put some fire under them, friends. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying let's like, you know, valorize the great history of UNESCO. It's a shit. I agree with you. I mean, you know, however much I like a lot of art and especially I like a lot of Western art. That doesn't mean I think that's the be all and end all. You know, uh, it's a shit. We can take it over. It's ready for your enthusiasm and your your work. Um, I suppose uh, the Two other things I'd like to talk about. Um, yeah, so in terms of the party political left and so on, you know, just the assembly itself is 200 social and political movements. Many of them are political parties. Um, look, it, it, political parties are, uh, you know, when, when we come into government as a political force, uh, we are just in, we don't know half the time what we're doing, frankly. And we have a problem because there are only a limited number of people in any political party and a left political party has a particular problem. If you don't send your best people into government, you fail. If you don't keep your best people in your movement, you fail. In other words, um, you have to both be in government and you have to build the capacity of the masses. So you have to do two things. We just don't have the people for it. In West Bengal, 
34 years, Sanjukta, most of our uh, party went into government and just totally neglected building mass struggles in Bengal. Um, after a point, the advantage of, of land reform, I mean, the very important land reform agenda, Operation Bargha, Panchayat, uh, you know, local self-government and so on, very good policies, but there was nobody, no mass struggles around those because your best people were sitting in writers building in Calcutta and so on. So the left has a great disadvantage in government. You know, you can eviscerate your own political base because you're all sitting writing policy, you know, and, and that's a that's an issue we have to grapple with. When you come into government, how do you build mass, the mass character of politics at the same time as you're being, you know, driving policy? Um, this is a problem that happens everywhere. It's not just in, in India or, or it's not just in what we're seeing in South Africa now, but it's in so many places where the left struggles with this. It struggled with this in Brazil. You know, the Workers' Party was in government, but they just ignored the mass struggles completely. And now when Lula has to return, it's in fact the landless workers movement that's doing most of the legwork for Lula because the PT, it allowed its own party formation to eviscerate while Lula and then Dilma were in government. Uh, so I think there is a real exercise we have to learn here. We have to learn a lot from how difficult it is to both have um, sufficient people. I mean, I, I'm just getting ready to release a book called Selected Ho Chi Minh, where I, I've got a whole selection of his writings, many new, translated for the first time from Vietnamese, including his 1927 lecture notes on revolution, which he gave in China at the party class. Anyway, in 1945, when the communists come to power in, in, in northern Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh writes a text which is very interesting. He says, we just don't have a technical people to come to power. You know, we'd, we don't know how to run these ministries and so on. And, and he warns in 1945, we can't put our best uh, cadre into government. We have to be building the land reform agenda and so on. Everybody recognizes this. We just don't have an easy solution. And that's why often when the left comes to power in a government, there are some real disadvantages that are inherent to the project of the left in government, which we need to theorize and think about and, and so on. Um, let, let the last thing then, Jahan, let the last thing be about money, because you asked that so impolitely. Um, who talks about money? I, I mean, uh, you, know, uh, you, you, you know, it's uh, such an impolite question anyway. Uh, but it's real, right? It's real. I don't want to talk about the IPA because that's a different level. I'll talk about my own institute. Um, my own institute, Tricontinental, uh, has been around now formally for about four years. Uh, we have about 50 people that work with us. That's an enormous amount of, of resources involved. Uh, we have offices in Sao Paulo in Brazil, in Buenos Aires in Argentina, in New Delhi in India, and in Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, and how do we do it? Well, one, we will never apply for a foundation grant. Never. I am never going to take money from the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. I will never take money from right wing foundations like the Open Society. Never. We'll never ask any of them ever for money. Secondly, we will not ask for individual donations because that's too exhausting. And then I'll have to get you know, 10 euros here, 5 euros there. People feel so happy to give you 10 euros as if they're saving the day. You know, they'll write, oh my God, I gave you 100 euros. Guys, that doesn't, uh, that's nothing. We can't uh, function with that kind of support, you know. And it's hard to raise money and then you have to have bank accounts in many countries because we are an international organization and so on. Okay, so how do you do it? Well, two ways. Firstly, because we are rooted in the International People's Assembly, uh, we have a lot of assistance from our political movements. So in uh, Argentina, for instance, all the members of our office are members of Patria Grande. They are the people who have PhDs in Patria Grande who are seconded to work for uh, our office. And they are incredibly motivated and fantastic researchers. And it's because all our researchers basically are linked to daily politics. Because of that, We've been able to develop a theory of intellectual work. Uh, we have a dossier at our website called The New Intellectual. And I really encourage you to go in and look at it because we feel like we want to reinterpret Marx's 11th thesis. You know, Marx writes, um, you know, the philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point, however, is to change it. 
In fact, I've often felt that Marx got that wrong um, because what we understand of that is not that. That's a too crude a formulation. We believe that if you are trying to change the world, you can better understand it. That those who don't try to change the world don't have as much wisdom about the world. When you try to change the world, you get what Fanon called the granite block. You understand the constraints, the problem. You have a better understanding of power if you're actually contesting power. If you're looking at power as a spectator, I don't think you get it as such. Uh, you can have illusions about the nature of power. So we operate under the principle, um, if you're trying to change the world, you really can better understand it. Not perfectly, but better understand it. So the first form of resources is we are well, well resourced by our movements. Uh, they really give us a lot of assistance whenever we need it. Secondly, um, we had a deep discussion about how to raise funds, serious funds. And the, the basic thing is the only thing that remains now is to go to really rich people who are left people and tell them fund us. And so uh, over the course of the last several years, I've found extraordinarily rich people, musicians, um, you know, people from the art world, uh, you know, some business people and so on. And, and I tell them I need I need serious money on the table, you know, not I don't want like a hundred euro donation. I need serious money. And they they put the money on the table. And that's the way we go. You know, a musician today, a rock musician, can sell out an amphitheater for this, uh, you know, just one tour, and they'll make three, four hundred million dollars a year. Three, four hundred million dollars a year. See, big, serious rock musicians. And, you know, all we need is just a fragment of that. So, so why you're, I, you're, why fa I, you're, founded, you're founded by, by rock musicians. That's the, the answer. Yes. Maybe we should wrap, up, wrap it up after this. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that is, in fact, a good way to end. Correct. <laughs> okay. That's a beautiful way to end. Thank you so much, Vijay. Yeah, thanks a lot. See you later. Bye.